Hi, and welcome. You might be wondering, Naivo, what are you doing stranded on an island with a single chest? What riches could this chest possibly hold? Well, it's nothing. <clears throat> and yet, it has 27 free slots. And if you combine it with another chest, it has even more space. space which is something I currently have none of at my own base. There's just... There's no space, there's... Why is there no space? As you can see, we clearly have a problem. But we have a solution. More chests. I then started planning for this, apparently, machine project. And thought to myself, why don't I let you guys decide what shape the room should be? I even threw in the big old circle and prayed that it wouldn't win. It won. Well, the plan is to make a big old hole in the ground that the storage room can fit into, and then build a room above it to decorate the place. This was surely a nice and very, very easy task. Right? Nope. That's right, fuckers, is woo or mate? This is a big problem. You see, a small puddle every now and then wouldn't be so bad, but what we had, gentlemen, were not small puddles. So, with all that being said, let's get to work. The first thing on the agenda is getting rid of all the water, from here and all the way down to the base. So, to start things out, I made a big outline of the area, and to get rid of this area, we had this. In short terms, a TNT bomber. But, in order for this to work, we first need to get rid of the icebergs. Now we can focus on draining all of the water, and for that we need to go to the end. But why the end you might ask? Well... You see, Minecraft has this little feature here. If you make something like this, you can make a sand duper, and then you might say... Oh Nairo, isn't that cheating? Well... <laughs> Once this is built, you simply go through, place some hoppers with some buttons, and then you have it. Infinite sand. We can use the sand to divide the ocean into smaller and more manageable bits. And to remove the water, we'll use sponges. Oh, there's our first one. Let me just grab some of you. Ooh, second one. And no sponges, of course. Three. No sponges. Four. No sponges. This continued for quite some time. In some cases I would find sponges, and in others I wouldn't. But after looting 12 monuments, I decided that about 4 stacks would be sufficient. Oh, I really hope this is enough. I don't want to go back and forth to dry the sponges. Well, you did. You did go back and forth. A lot. I then went back, sorted my items, went back to the nether to dry the sponges, and began draining the water. This was in fact a very, very tedious process. All I did for the next 10 hours was placing sponges, picking up sponges, drying sponges in the nether, and it didn't help very much that I only brought 4 stacks of sponges, which meant that I had to go dry them more often. Well, we might as well just... And there we have it. The water is all drained, and we can move on to blowing stuff up. Hmm. Hmm. And to make the TNT bomber, we need materials such as slime blocks, observers, pistons, sticky pistons, stained glass, blocks of redstone, walls, redstone lamps. It's done. And then, it was time. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Let's get this thing running. It's working! It's working! Yes! Let's go! At first it went very well. But then... Water! And now is probably a good time to explain why water is such a bitch. If you drop TNT on any surface, except for obsidian and bedrock, then the explosion will cause some damage. Very good. But if TNT instead is in contact with water when exploding, then... No good. And all the water I previously removed was just the surface water. 
That's right. I had in fact forgotten to remove all the water below. And when I went down to check, oh boy. Oh no. Oh my god. Well, even though this discovery was quite irritating, there really was nothing else to do than to get to work. So, I got to work. There was a hole back here. No. No. Oh, I forgot this was here. Mm. Wait, how? Wait, how deep is this thing? No way. There's no way. Well, let's get back to work. I managed to drain the last bit of water that night, which took 11 Minecraft days for anyone wondering. Also, you can track the days in the top left corner since I added the day counter, but only when I'm in player POV. And for those who are wondering and are too lazy to go back, I started this episode on day 237. Anyways, I mined the sides all the way down to where the storage system would be. This is done so I can remove the blocks at the top and make the water flow down. And as many of you already know, this will make the edges nice and sexy. And then once again, it was time to release the mob. Alright, so it did do some damage to the base, so let me just patch that up real quick. Ah! Jesus! Let's get the shit out of me. Now, the storage system. This was the first of many I designed in creative, and it was hideous. After a few tweaks here and there, I came up with this design. And when it was finally done, I thought it would be a very good idea not to test it and it brings me back to why i hate circles many of you have likely built an automatic storage system before and everyone usually builds them like this in a straight line but not in circles and there's a good reason why first of all the transportation system hoppers is great for transporting items but a ton of them can make the game very laggy and make your computer explode that's why you would normally use water for item transportation, since it's less laggy. There's just one small, tiny little flaw. This cannot be done in circles. No matter what I did, or how long I spent, I just couldn't get it to work. The other problem is the redstone itself. Normally, the redstone would look something like this, in a straight line. And when the items get sent through, perfectly sorted. But if the redstone is in shape of a circle, and we try sorting the items. The system will break. And the loot will scatter like rats. Mm, loot. <clears throat> Wait, is that a fucking rat in my chest? Oh, fuck. I of course didn't know this would happen because I never tested it. So after building the storage system, noticing a problem, realizing what the problem was, it's the goddamn corners, trying to come up with a way to fix it, realizing that I have absolutely no idea what the fuck I'm doing, I just tore it down and built it in a square. After rebuilding it and wasting a shit ton of hoppers, I could finally start sorting my items. Oh, that's gonna be so nice. And just to give a quick run through, there are three main chests the output chest, which is for empty shulker boxes. 
and the input chest, which are for regular items and shulker boxes. The items will get transported through here and over to the item elevators. The shulker boxes will then one by one be unloaded. Whenever a shulker is empty, this comparator will give out a signal, making the piston push and break the shulker box into a hopper. The shulker box will then travel back down into the output chest. Meanwhile, the items will continue down the line. Whenever a certain item reaches a certain hopper containing the same item, the hopper will recognize the item and grab it. And that is the basic concept of the storage system. Now, let's continue. While the storage system is really great and all, it's still missing something, because it's really ugly to look at. To be fair, this entire place is really ugly to look at. And to fix that, I've come up with a plan. <clears throat> Alright class, sit down. Jeremy, you fucker, sit down! Alright, the plan requires a shitload of black concrete. 1,388 stacks to be exact. Lucky for us, we have already constructed an infinite sand duper, which also works for concrete powder. Alright, who added this audio? <coughs> Jeremy, I know it was you. <sighs> Let's just continue. Hmm. Oh yeah. Because we want concrete and not concrete powder, we will construct a concrete converter right next to the powder farm. <laughs> powder farm. Jeremy, get the fuck out of my class. <coughs> Let's just get to it. <laughs> Oh yeah! Time to put down the concrete! Now, with 873 stacks placed and this place looking much better, I had this to say. Yeah, that looks much better. That's right, but we're not done. We still need a roof, and that thing needs an exterior. Now, this is where I fucked up. This particular exterior needs a lot of a very specific material. What material? Crying obsidian. And why crying obsidian? <laughs> I don't know. Looks cool. Crying Obsidian can be found at Ruin Portals, but they usually only have a very small amount of them, like this one for instance. It has one. So using this method would be a very bad idea. So let's scratch that. Know your fucking place, trash! And introduce you to... Bartering. Mm -hmm. Crying Obsidian has an 8.71% chance of dropping when bartering with a pickling. Which means, it would take on average 5.73 gold ingots to obtain one crying obsidian. And we need 50 stacks. This also means that we'll be needing almost 20,000 gold ingots for the bartering. And to make myself suffer even more, I built this gold farm. By Yannick Safar. Don't get me wrong, this farm is really simple and very, very efficient. It produces a whopping 3200 gold ingots per hour. The catch? I'll be doing all the killing. Now why would I put myself in this horrible situation? The answer is simple. The looting enchantment. Looting increases the maximum number of possible item drops. This means that if I have looting 3, I could potentially get all the gold 3 times faster. It still ended up taking 7 hours though. And with about 90% collected, I realized something. <gasps> I could have used an auto clicker, no! Yep. With the gold collected, it was time for step number two, the bartering. My first approach was just placing boats, waiting for the piglins to spawn, luring them into the boats and bartering with them. Drop the goddamn crying obsidian. Now! But this was painfully slow. It's so slow. Uh... We need something faster, something better, something bigger. <clears throat> we need ENX04. Of course, this guy has it. He's a legend. So, let's construct it. <laughs> Alright, let's test this bad boy. Give it to me, give it to me. Come on. Seventy 
Jesus. Yeah, we need more of this. And while I barter with these fellas down here, let me explain how this works. Three mobs will spawn on this platform. Hucklings, Pikmin, and Picklings. We only want the Picklings and their bartering. So what do we do? Well, Hucklings are scared of warp fungus. So these are placed in the corners, forcing them to run to the middle and into the hole. This will cause them to despawn, since we'll be AFKing 128 blocks from that. The baby picklings can't bother, so we don't need them. That's what these holes are for. They'll run into the corners, drop one block and despawn. And the pigment will target this turtle egg and eventually despawn. Picklings are scared of soul fire, so soul torches are placed in the middle, making them run along the edges of the room. They'll eventually end up at this dispenser, which is armed with pumpkins, placing one on each mob passing under it. This will make the picklings unable to despawn, and voila! The bartering farm is done. With the crying obsidian collected, we can start the work on the exterior. Oh, it's finally time to build this thing! I want the exterior and this entire room to feel alien. The reason behind all the black concrete is to make the entire room pitch black, so it feels infinite. Hello there. The exterior, let's refer to it as the cube, is supposed to be this broken space relic that somehow appeared and corrupted the world. That's what happened to the base below. Other than the black concrete and the crying obsidian, I also need a ton of blue stained glass. So I have kate at the sand dupe for a while and melted it at the base. I want the cube to have this fading glow effect coming from the sides and the top to kinda add to the space theme. And for that I'll use the glass and some pearlescent frog light. I built a farm for that on day 300. So yeah, that's um, that's the look I'm going for. Keep that in mind. Now, let's build it. Let's take a look. Yeah, that is looking really nice so far. It's not completely done yet. While building, I was thinking, you know what? I think it would look even better if we added some vines and moss to it to give it that old look. But I think I'll add the roof first just to see what it looks like. Now that it's done, I encountered a problem. Oh uh, yeah, I forgot the mobs would spawn down here. I then tried fixing the problem by placing lights down, but that just defeats the whole purpose of it looking infinite. Hello there. Then I had another idea. What if I use black carpet to make it spawn proof? But that just looked off. I truly felt stuck. Like what else can you do to not make the mob spawn? And that's when it hit me. The mob switch. The mob cap is at 70 for hostile mobs. This means that as long as 70 mobs are alive, no additional mobs will spawn. We can use this mechanic to make our own mob switch, effectively turning off all mob spawn in our entire world. To do this, we need a mob that doesn't despawn. But we can't use name tags, boats, minecarts, or pumpkins like we did for the barter farm, because then the mobs won't count towards the mob cap. So which mobs could we use? The first option is the shulker, since they don't despawn. But I really don't want to have to deal with transporting one to the overworld. The second option is the warden, but that would also be a lot of pain to deal with. The last option is the zombie villager. For this to work, we'll first have to trade with 70 villagers, locking their trades, and then simplifying them. This will make them unable to despawn and still count towards the mob cap. The zombie villagers definitely sound at least annoying, so let's go with that one. Alright, I think these are the right chunks. What I'm referring to here is the spawn chunks. For this to work, we'll need to make a box that goes from the entity taking spawn chunks to the taking spawn chunks. Which means that when the mobs are on one side, they'll count towards the mob cap, and on the other side, they won't. 
This will make it a lot easier for us to switch between mobs being able or unable to spawn in our world. I think the best option here is to just get a few villagers down here and then place a ton of beds. So I did. I brought two, placed some beds, gave them some privacy, and kept repeating this for a very long time. And after 7-8 hours, I had all the 70 villagers. Oh yeah! Time to turn these guys. <laughs> it sounds like they're done in there. Yep, let's test it then. And of course, after going through all of that, it didn't work. Wait. Why are the mobs down here? Did, did I do something wrong? I then opened my trusty web browser to scour the Minecraft wiki for any clues. And I found this. A mob may pick up an item. Blah, 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 blah. Prevents it from despawning, but also removes it from the map cap. They all have something picked up. I really don't want to have to kill them and start all over. So I thought of a solution. And then I got a brilliant idea. What if we cure all the zombie villagers? That should make them drop their items. And then we turn them again. Genius. So I went back to the gold farm, got the gold, and went to the nearest forest, in search of apples. I then brewed some weakness potions, crafted the golden apples, placed down some hoppers to catch the items, and started curing them. Run! Come on! Oh. It's working! Hmm. <laughs> yes. After the curing process, I brought back my trusty Suma. <laughs> and now, surely, after going through all the trouble, it should work, right? No. Yep. It was still not working. It's still not working. I think you all know what this means. It means that I would have to kill- This time, I was playing it safe. I wanted to find a way for the whole process to run on its own and without the risk of zombie villagers picking up items. And that's when I came across this design by Logical Geek Boy. This contraption works by having a villager breeder. Whenever a baby villager spawns in, it eventually wanders towards these beds and falls down into a stream. From there it's transported to this platform, over time will grow up and be tall enough to continue down to this corner. I'll then be standing ready on the other side. And with the push of a button, a minecart will circle around the contraption, pick up the villager. I'll do the trade, and the villager will be sent off to the zombification chamber. This process was a lot slower than the other one. It took about 12 hours to complete. But god damn, it was worth it. Because when I had all the villagers, and I double checked that the villagers didn't have any items in their hands. Sorry to have anything in your hands. I tested it. It looks like it's working. Wait, is it actually working? Oh, yes. But the real reason we spent so long building this thing was back home. Last one. And with that, fellas, we are done. Oh, no mobs are spawning. That's so nice. Thank you so much for watching. Was it worth it, though? All right, see ya. No.